Hello everyone. Uh, we're going to continue on with our program today. Um, essentially, uh, what we're going to do is to move into uh, slightly more advanced problems. Problems that might require a little manipulation in our problem formulation. From there, we're going to uh, continue on and look at, or we're going to continue on and solve using graphing and the methods we've already looked at. Uh, this is our last section on solving these problems manually. Uh, from the next couple weeks, we're going to move into computer solutions. Uh, the reason we use the computer is as problems get more advanced, sometimes it can be inefficient uh, in general to try to solve problems like this manually. So we're going to look at computer solutions that will allow us to solve slightly more difficult problems in a much more efficient manner. Uh, we're going to do that with a variety of programs and I will discuss that in the future. So continuing on, uh, what we're doing today is, as I said, we're looking at um, a situation where we're solving a couple slightly more advanced problems. Let's look at the first one. As always, we begin with problem formulation. The key is to interpret the problems, and especially as we move into the future, it's going to be critically important to interpret the problems carefully because when we go into computer solutions, the actual difficult aspect of it is problem formulation. So I'm going to go step by step following the exact instructions you should do every time that you process this sort of situation. So ShirtStop makes t-shirts with logos and sells them in its chain of retail stores. It contracts from two different plants, one in Puerto Rico and one in the Bahamas. The shirts from the plant in Puerto Rico cost $46 per unit but 9% of them are defective and can't be sold. The shirts from the Bahamas cost only 35 cents each, but they have an 18% defective rate. ShirtStop needs 3,500 shirts to retain its relationship with the two plants. It must order at least 1,000 shirts from each factory. It would also like at least 88% of the shirts it receives to be saleable. So, we must begin interpreting this question. The first thing, as always, is we have to look at decision variables. ShirtStop makes t-shirts from the first sentence with logos and sells them in its chain of retail stores. It contracts from two different plants. We know this is a two-variable problem. Most likely, we've just found our decision variables. Puerto Rican manufacturing plant and Bahamas manufacturing plant. Once we have our two decision variables, we can move on to the next stage of the problem. Shirt Stops makes t-shirts with logos and sells them. Puerto Rican shirts cost 46 cents per unit. Bahamas only cost 35 cents each. From this information, we can put together our objective function. As we see, we're manufacturing. When we manufacture, we don't want to spend a lot of money. That just goes without saying. We don't want to spend more money than necessary when we're manufacturing a product. So we know in this situation we have a minimization problem. We're trying to minimize Z or our manufacturing costs. We also know from the information given that Puerto Rico, the plant in Puerto Rico is 46 cents per t-shirt. The plant in the Bahamas is 35 cents per t-shirt. So now we have our decision variables, we know it's a minimization, and we have the 
parameters attached to that. So our objective function that we can see at the bottom of the screen becomes min z equals 0.46x1 plus 0.35x2. That's the first step. Once, we do the, once we've completed our objective function, the next obvious step that we've followed time and time again is to move on to our constraints. As we move to the next screen, we see constraint number one. Shirt stop needs 3,500 shirts. This is our minimum requirement. We get from we get shirts from Puerto Rico. We get shirts from the Bahamas. Puerto Rico is X1. The Bahamas is X2. So our total amount received from X1 and X2 must be 3,500 or more. Any less than that, we cannot proceed. That's our first constraint. Any decision or any ordering choice must have a minimum of 3,500 shirts included. Once we do that, we move on to our second constraint. 9% of them are defective from Puerto Rico. 18% of them are defective from the Bahamas. We want at least 88% of the shirts to be saleable. Now there's several different ways that we can do this. We can make it 0.09x1 plus 0.082x2 must be less than or equal to 0.08 or 0.88. That's possible because we know 88% of the shirts must be saleable. However, I've done it a little differently. I have 0.91x1, which is 91% of the shirts from Puerto Rico will be okay. And 0.82x2, because 82% of the shirts from the Bahamas will be okay. So the 91% of what we order from X1 plus 82% of what we order from X2 must be, and this was a small mistake, greater than or equal to 3,080. That 3,080, where do we get that number? Well, we know 88% of the shirts have to be saleable. The shirts that it receives. How many shirts are they receiving? A minimum of 3,500. We talked about that in the last constraint. If they're receiving 3,500 shirts, and 88% of them must be saleable, 88% of 3,500 is... 3,080. So what this constraint that we see at the bottom means is 91% of the Puerto Rican shirts and 82% of the Bahama shirts will be saleable. And this total number that we receive from both must be more than 3,080 because that's the minimum amount that must be saleable given that we're receiving 3,500 shirts. This is an example of a problem that we have to read carefully, understand what is happening, and then manipulate the information into our constraint equations. Now, let's move on to the next constraint. We see here, to retain its relationship with the two plants, it must order at least 1,000 shirts from each factory. What this means is, because it wants, because the, they want to continue working with both factories, the minimum order is 1,000. Any choice that has less than 1,000 from each factory is not valid. That's what we've represented here. 
the minimum order from Puerto Rico, x1, must be 1,000. Separately, the minimum order from the Bahamas must be 1,000. So we get two separate constraints. x1 is greater than or equal to 1,000. x2 is greater than or equal to 1,000. That's what we've seen here so far. We have now not one, not two, but four constraints. So as always, we collect everything together and we see our minimization is Z, 0.46X1 plus 0.35X2, subject to these four constraints that we've outlined above x1 plus x2 is greater than or equal to 3,500. 0.91x1 plus 0.82x2 must be greater than or equal to 3,080. x1 is greater than or equal to 1,000. x2 is greater than or equal to 1,000. We've seen all of this so far. Now, let's move on to the next step. Problem graphing. When we saw when we graph, now we've already solved it. Uh, we've already formulated the problem. But I'm going to go through with you, and we're going to solve or we're going to formulate the problem again. Because we want to follow the steps to go step by step through the problem solving process, so that we get used to this before we move on to slightly more difficult tasks. So, the first thing we do is we draw our graph. I've done that here. Now when we graph, when we draw the graph, one way to do that is to look at the constraints. We know we're going to be drawing constraint lines on our graph. So what we can do is we can look at a couple of the constraints, we can let x1 equal 0, we can let x2 equal 0. And that will allow us to see what measurements we'll need on our graph. These are the ones I've chosen. I've gone 0 to 4,000 4, uh, on the x1 axis and 0 to 4,000 on the x2 axis or the x and y axes. We're not sure yet if that's correct. So let's move on. Once we've drawn our graph, we're going to begin writing in our problem formulation. Because we solved it here, but it wasn't really necessary to solve it here. This is kind of what I did for you. Instead, we could have solved it in the problem, which we did down here. So I've written our objective function here, minimize z equals 0.46x1 plus 0.35x2. And this is step one. Once we do that, we begin writing in our constraints as well. The first one, we see here, x1 plus x2 is greater than or equal to 3,500. We're not going to write in the line yet, because first we want to collect all of our constraints in this system. That's what we're doing right now. 0.91x1 plus 0.82x2 less or greater than or equal to 3,080. That's a small mistake on my part. We repeat again. x1 is greater than or equal to 1,000. And finally, x2 is greater than or equal to 1,000. So what we've done is our problem formulation that we previously went through in the preceding slides, we've now collected here on or near our graph so that we can reference it when needed. The next step is drawing our constraint lines. How do we draw constraint lines? Very simply, 
we let x1 equal 0 to find our x2 point, and then we let x2 equal 0 to find our x1 point, where the lines cross the x and y axes, and then we connect those two points. Let's do that for our first constraint line. x1 plus x2 is greater than or equal to 3,500. If x1 is 0, x2 becomes 3,500. If x1 is 0, x2 becomes 3,500. So we have two lot. We have a line that will intersect on the y-axis at 3,500, and it will intersect on the x-axis at 3,500. That we know. That's what we've shown here. This rep. This line represents all the places where we are reaching 3,500 total units. We can get 3,500 units from the Bahamas. We can get 3,500 units from Puerto Rico. Any point on this line will be a total of 3,500 units received. If we look at where on the x-axis at 1,800 and we go up, it's about 17 or it's about 1,700 units, 17 plus 18 is 3,500 units. Anywhere on this line, we will have, we will receive a total of 3,500 units from one factory, the other factory, or a combination of both factories. We now repeat this process for our second constraint line. 0.91x1 plus 0.82x2 is less or greater than or equal to 3,080. If x1 is 0, x2 is 3,080 divided by 0 0.082. x2 becomes 3,756. And we see that at 0x1, x2 is 3,756 approximately. We repeat again. If x2 is 0, x1 is 3,080 divided by 0 0.91. x1 becomes 3,384. Again, the line is drawn on the graph. And we see it intersects the y y axis at 3756 it intersects the y and axis or the x axis at 3384 so we have our first two lines on the graph we know that now next We're going to draw in our first of the two additional constraints. That's what we've done here. So we have x1 is greater than or equal to 1,000. We have the same situation. One more time. x2 is greater than or equal to 1,000 or, in this case, equal to 1,000. So what we have here is uh, we've now completed all of our constraint lines. We're going to move on to the next section. What I've done is very briefly, uh, I've redrawn everything. And the reason I did that was very simply just for a little clarity. Um, I wasn't happy with the way the graph was looking, and graphing is important because it does give us visual clues as to whether we've solved the problem correctly or not. So in this situation, you can see that now we have all four of our constraint lines drawn on the graph. And we can see three different intersection points where C3 meets C2 where C1 meets C2, 
and where C2 meets C4. That might be a little more clear here. So we have these three intersection points. Because it's a minimization, we know it's going to be the area farthest from the graph. A correct minimization, a perfect minimization, would be 0, 0. But with constraints in minimization problems, they take us further and further away from the origin, point zero, 0, In this situation, we have a scenario where we want to be at zero, 0, but we have minimum requirements. And those minimum requirements or constraints keep us away from zero, 0, So our optimal choices will be the three points, or all of the points, closest to zero, 0, We see that these points closest to 0 are A, where C3 meets C2, B, where C1 meets C2, and C, where C2 meets C4. So, very simply, we have to solve, or we have to determine what these three points are. That's what we're going to do now. So we come over, and we see that at point A, we know x1 is going to be 1,000, because we know the graph or the line is vertical at that point. We also know that x at point C, x2 is going to be 1,000, because we have a horizontal line at that point. So we know these points. What we don't know yet is the second point for A, or the, the x2 coordinate for A, the x1 coordinate for C, and neither of the x1 or x2 coordinates for B. That's what we have to find now using basic algebraic problem-solving techniques. That's what I've done here for points A and B. For A, we simply substitute the known 1,000 for x1 into the equation x1 plus x2 equals 3,500. We do that because that is the line meeting the C3 constraint line. So we x1 plus x2 is 3,500, x1 becomes 1,000, x2 remains unknown. We subtract 1,000 from 3,500, x2 becomes 2,500. We do the same at point C, exactly as we did at point A. And we replace in these two, we now get 1,000, 2,500, 2,500, 1,000. Points A and point B are now known. Ah, uh, point A and point C are now known. What we do not have yet is point B. We will find that in the next section. To find point B, we have to find the two lines that meet. At point B, we know it is C1 and C2. That's what I've written in here. x1 plus x2 equals 3,500. 0.91x1 plus 0.82x2 is 3,080. We have to equalize these equations to eliminate one of the variables. The easiest way to do that is to multiply one of the equations by one of every aspect of one of the equations by a number to allow us to eliminate one of the variables. That is what I've done here. Because we have 0.91x1 and 0.82x2, I'm going to multiply C1 by 0 0.82 
if I do that, I get 0.2x1 plus 0.2x2 equals 2,870. We subtract these equations to eliminate x2, and we get minus 0.09x1 equal to minus 210. X1 then becomes minus 210 divided by 0 0.09, and we get 2,330. 2,333.33. That's what we've found so far. That subs in for the x1 coordinate in point B, and then we solve one more time for point A, uh, point x2. We take 2,333.33, which is our x1 coordinate, and we plug it into equation C1. 2,333.33 plus x2 is equal to 3,500. x2 is equal to 3,500 minus 2,333.33. x2 is 1,166.67. So now we plug that in and we've found all three possible optimal choices. These are our three possibilities. We don't know yet though which one minimizes costs. To find out which one minimizes costs, we have to go one step further. We have to multiply a, b, and c by our objective function. And that's what I've done here. A is 1,000 times 0.46 plus 2,500 times 0 0.35. B, 2,333.33 times 0 0.46 plus 1,166.67 times 0 0.35. And C, 2,500 times 0 0.46 plus 1,000 times 0 0.35. And we get our cost if each of these ordering choices are made. If we order 1,000 units from Puerto Rico and 2,500 units from the Bahamas, point A, our cost will be $1,335. If we order 2,333.33 shirts from Puerto Rico and 1,166 0.67 shirts from the Bahamas, our cost will be $1,481.66. And if we order 2,500 shirts from Puerto Rico and 1,000 shirts from the Bahamas, our cost will be $1,500. A is the correct choice because it minimizes costs. We write that final step at the top our optimal choice is A. We should order 1,000 units from Puerto Rico and 2,500 units from Bahamas. This satisfies all of our constraints at the lowest possible cost of $1,335. This is a complete solution of a slightly more complex linear programming problem and the reason it was complex is because we had to manipulate the numbers because we had different units of measurements. And that is one of the things where people can make mistakes because we do not often pay attention to that sort of situation. Now, moving on to our second question. This was a complete example and a good example of what you may be expected to do on our final exam. We also had several questions like this that you may have been expected to do on the midterm exam. So please familiarize yourself 
with this process. Moving on to question number two. It's again a two decision variable problem, but it is slightly more complex because we have to, in some ways, manipulate the numbers in order to find a satisfactory solution. Angela and Bob Ray keep a large garden in which they grow cabbage, tomatoes, and onions to make two kinds of relish, chow chow relish and tomato relish. The chow chow is made primarily of cabbage, whereas the tomato relish has more tomatoes than the chow chow. Both relishes include onions and negligible amounts of bell peppers and spices. A jar of chow chow contains eight ounces of cabbage, three ounces of tomatoes, and three ounces of onions. Whereas a jar of tomato relish contains six ounces of tomatoes, six ounces of cabbage, and two ounces of onions. The rays grow 120 pounds of cabbage, 90 pounds of tomatoes, and 45 pounds of onions each summer. The rays can produce no more than 24 dozen jars of relish. They make $2.25 in profit from a jar of chow chow and $1.95 in profit from a jar of tomato relish. The rays want to know how many jars of each kind of relish they can produce to generate the most profit. This is our basic natural language question. From here, we have to begin interpretation. Again, as I said before, interpretation becomes even more important in the future. When we're solving these problems, both mathematically and graphically, we have two ways to check if, if our answer appears to be correct. We can check our math, and we can check to see if it matches what we see on our graph. However, when we are solving with the computer, when we're solving with the um, programs given to us, we don't have a way of checking if our answers are correct. So if we've entered something incorrectly, we, do, we are not in a situation where we are able to check if the answer is correct. So until now, we've had multiple means of solving, which gives us multiple means of checking if we are correct. In the future, we won't have that. So instead, we have to be very careful with problem formulation. Let's go ahead and begin that now. The first step, as always, is identifying the decision variables. And we know right away, it seems very clear in this question, that our decision variables are going to be which kinds of relish to produce. We have chow chow and we have tomato. So let's go to the last sentence that I've highlighted here. They make $2.25 in profit from a jar of chow chow and $1.95 in profit from a jar of tomato relish. The, the rays want to know how many jars of each kind of relish they can produce to generate the most profit. Therefore, we know right away that this is going to be a maximization pro problem. We also know our first decision variable is chow chow, so that's x1. And our second decision variable is tomato relish, that becomes x2. We attach the, the correct parameters to each decision variable. And we finally arrive at our objective function. Max z equals 2.25x1 plus 1.95x2. Moving on, 
once we've completed our objective function, again, we have to look at constraints. Let's look at our first constraint. A jar of chow chow contains eight ounces of cabbage. A jar of tomato relish contains six ounces of cabbage. The rays grow 120 pounds of cabbage. Here is our first confusing point that we have to interpret in some way. We see that the amount of cabbage per jar is given in ounces. The amount of jar cabbage total is given in pounds. Those are two different units of measurements. If we attempt to solve like this, we will get the incorrect answer. So, what we have to do now is we have to convert one of these measurements so that they are all the same unit of measurement. What I've done is I've converted pounds to ounces. You can go both ways. You could theoretically convert ounces to pounds, but it's easier for me to do it the other way, converting pounds to ounces. Now, a quick Google search, if you are unaware, will reveal that there are 16 pounds per ounce, uh, 16 ounces per pound. So to convert our pounds to ounces, we have to multiply by 16. We know that we have 120 pounds of cabbage grown. We want to know not pounds of cabbage, but ounces. So we multiply 120 times 16, which gives us 1,920 ounces of cabbage available. Once we've reached this point, it becomes relatively simple. What we have to do now is we have to write our equation, as I've done at the bottom, 8x1, 8 ounces per chow chow, plus 6x2, 6 ounces per tomato relish, must be less than or equal to 1,920, which is the total number of ounces of cabbage available to us. That's what we've done so far. Next, we're going to move on to our second constraint. And our second constraint, a jar of chow chow contains three ounces of tomatoes. A jar of tomato relish contains six ounces of tomatoes. I'm reading the red highlighted text. The rays grow 90 pounds of tomatoes. This, again, is something that we have looked at prior, and we have to convert the 90 pounds of tomatoes into ounces. So we multiply 90 times 16, and we get the final solution of 1,440 ounces of tomatoes. We are in a situation now where it becomes very simply, once they've all been converted to ounces, writing our constraint as I've done below. 3x1, 3 ounces per jar of chow chow, plus 6x2, 6 ounces per jar of tomato relish must be less than the total amount of tomatoes available, 1,440 ounces. That's our second constraint. We have another constraint that we'll look at now. And the key with these is finding the common unit of measurement. A jar of chow chow contains three ounces of onions. A jar of tomato relish contains two ounces of onions. Again, I'm reading the red highlighted text. The rays grow 45 pounds of onions each summer. So here we've found that 
once again we have to convert pounds of onions into ounces of onions. And we do that by multiplying by 16. 45 times 16 is 720. Once we've found our common unit of measurement, it becomes a very easy thing to write the equation 3x1, 3 ounces per jar of chow chow, plus 2x2, 2 ounces of onion per jar of tomato relish. And our total onion used must be less than or equal to 100, 720, which is our total amount of ounces of onions available. We have one final constraint. And again, this is slightly confusing because it is not given to us in the correct format. Let's look at that now. The rays can produce no more than 24 dozen jars of relish. What that means is they can't produce 24 jars of relish. They can produce 24 times 12 jars of relish. 24 times 12, which is 288 jars of relish. A very different situation from 24 jars of relish. So we're in a situation now where once again we have to convert to find an appropriate measurement. So x1 plus x2 is less than or equal to 288 total jars. So we've taken a question that initially looked very simple but was a little bit more complicated because of unit conversion. But once we converted the units and we've officially collected all the information, which we will do next, it becomes a problem to solve like we've done in the past. Let's move on to that now. Information collection, as always. Max Z equals 2.25x1 plus 1.95x2, subject to these constraints. 8x1 plus 6x2 is less than or equal to 1,920. 3x1 plus 6x2 is less than or equal to 1,440. 3x1 plus 2x2 is less than or equal to 720. And x1 plus x2 is less than or equal to 288. That's what we've done so far. Now we're going to begin solving, and we'll do that together. Just like before, step one, we draw the graph. In this situation, I've chosen these numbers. Roughly, I don't know yet if they're perfect, but let's have a look together to see how well I did. The first thing we do is again, we want to collect all the relevant information in one place so that we can reference it when needed, when problem solving. That's what I've done here by writing the objective function onto my graphing paper. I write my first constraint. And again, we're not going to immediately draw our constraints yet because we want to take our time and make sure all of the appropriate information is contained in one spot. I've done that here and here. So now I have my graph drawn. The question interpretation that we looked at prior to this is now completed. And all of the relevant information is now written here for us to reference if and when it becomes necessary when solving this problem. If there are any questions about what I'm doing, please don't hesitate to message me on Kakao. Because of the imperfect corona situation we're in, the COVID-19 situation, I cannot teach this face-to-face. -face. 
and it can be difficult to follow at times. If you are not following, I cannot help you because I don't know that unless you contact me. So please, if you are having trouble following, contact me before it becomes too late, before the final exam. There were, or the midterm exams weren't great, they weren't terrible, but there are quite a few students who clearly are not following what's happening to date. If that's the case, you're running out of time to contact me. Please keep that in mind. Once I've written my constraints down, I want to write in my constraint line. The first one, we allow x1 to be 0, so x2 becomes 320, and x2 to be 0, so x1 becomes 240. And then we connect those two lines from the x1 and x2 axes, as I've done here, and that becomes constraint line number one. Constraint line number one is the place where, or the line that represents all choices, where our supply of cabbage is being fully used. Any choice on that line will be using all of the cabbage available to us. It will use all 1,920 ounces of cabbage. We then repeat this step a second time for C2. That's what I've done here. In C2, I allow x1 to be 0, so x2 becomes 240. And I allow x2 to be 0, so x1 becomes 480. I then connect those two points. What that line represents, again, is the points where all of our tomatoes will be used. If we choose any production choice on that line, then all of the tomatoes available to us will be used to manufacture. If it is above C1, but below C2, we have enough tomatoes, but not enough onions. If it's above C2, but below C1, we have enough onions, but not enough tomatoes. So please be aware of that situation. Next, we draw in our third constraint. And I've done that here. I make x2 1 equal to 0, so x2 becomes 360. And then we make x2 0, and x1 becomes 240. So we see here that the amount of onions will probably be irrelevant. Any choice that satisfies constraints 1 and 2 will also satisfy constraint 3. Constraint 3 is above all the other choices. So what that means is that it is irrelevant to our problem-solving solution. Any choice where we have enough of tomatoes and enough cabbage, we will also have enough onions. So onions becomes unimportant. We didn't know that before, but now looking at it visually on the graph, we see that that is the case. One more time, we're going to draw a fourth line on the constraint or on the graph because we have a fourth constraint. We do that here. x1 plus x2 is equal to 288. We let x1 equal 0, x2 is 288. We do the same for x2 equals 0, x1 becomes 288. We can see already that I made a mistake. What was it? In this case, I drew my graph too small. In this case, it is unclear from what we've seen 
that we are in a scenario where I can't tell on the graph what's happening because I drew it too small. So in that situation, we have to be, or we should theoretically be more careful at first or redraw the graph. I'm not going to because I wanted to make this mistake to show you what might happen in this scenario. It's something that we should, we have to be careful about when drawing our initial graphs. Otherwise, the point of graphing becomes lost as we've seen here. So let's move on because we don't need to solve graphically because we can still solve mathematically and that's what we're going to do next. Hopefully you've drawn your graphs, if you were drawing along with me, you drew your graph a little better, or at least you'll draw your graph a little better in the future. So let's continue. We now know that we have three points, A, B, and C, that are relevant to our situation. Because it's a maximization, we want to be as far away from the origin 0, 0 as possible. And unlike a minimization, it's our constraints that hold us down instead of holding us up. That's what we have here. So we have three points, and we're going to solve for each of those points. The first one we know is 0, 240 because we can see visually that's where it aligns. The second, or the third point, is 240. Again, we can see visually where it aligns. What we are unsure of right now, though, is point B. Point B, we can see it, but because our graph is drawn so small, we can't, we don't really know exactly what numbers it represents. So if we were to do this graph again, our biggest point on line on the y-axis would be 360. Our highest point on the x-axis would be 480. We have a lot of wasted space on our graph. So we do it again and we'd make that a little different, but for now we're just going to solve mathematically. I do that here by by writing in the two lines that I think intersect at point B. Again, because my, my graph is so small, I'm not sure. So I have three at, at C2, C4, we then have to solve. C2, 3x1 plus 6x2 is less than or equal to 1440. And C4, x1 plus x2 is less than or equal to 288. Again, we have to multiply one of these equations by a factor in order to eliminate one of the variables. In this case, because 3 was smaller, I chose to uh, multiply each section of equation C4 by the number 3. And we get 3x1 plus 3x2 less than or equal to 864 we subtract from there and we get 3x2 is equal to 576 and we get x2 is equal to 192. Then we plug in 192 into our equation. x1 plus 192 equals 288 x1 is equal to 288 minus 192. x1 is equal to 96. We've found our coordinates for point B, we think. However, we're not 100% sure. Because we graphed so badly, we're not 100% sure which lines are intersecting. So, we're going to run a brief experiment, and we're going to try this again with C2 and C1. If x1 or x2 is the same, then we know we found that point. We know we have the correct answer. 
So let's go, and we see here we have 8x1 plus 6x2 equals 1,920 minus 3x1 plus 6x2 equals 1,440. We don't have to multiply anything because the x2s will automatically cancel out. So we get 5x1 is equal to 480. We divide 480 by 5, and we get x1 is equal to 96. This tells us we have chosen the correct points for point. We not have chosen. We have found the correct points for point B. That's what we've done is we've double checked here. This isn't always necessary. And if I would graphed better, it would have been totally unnecessary. So we see that in this section, we do want to be careful when we are initially setting up our graph because that's how we allow, or that's how we're able to find, or that's how we're able to avoid double checking unnecessarily like we had to do here. So continuing on, we're now going to write in our two coordinates for point B. So now we found all three possible optimal solutions. Point A, 0, 240. Point B, 96, 192. Point C, 240, 0. What these points represent are manufacturing choices. We can manufacture at point A 240 jars of tomato relish. At point B, we can manufacture 96 jars of chow chow and 192 jars of tomato relish. Or at point C, we can manufacture 240 jars only of chow chow. But we don't know which of these three possible optimal choices is correct. To figure that out, we have to go a little bit further and we have to multiply each of these numbers by our costs, by our revenue. Sorry, not costs, but revenue. That's what we do in the next step. I manufacture each of our three possible choices by our revenue per jar. And so we see if we, if we multiply each of them by the revenue, we get at point A, $468 in revenue, at point B, $590.4 in revenue, and at point C, $540 in revenue. So therefore, the ideal production choice is option B. They should produce 96 jars of chow chow and 192 jars of tomato. That will, given their limited resources, make them the most money. If they choose that choice, they will make a total of $590.40, which is more money than if they'd made either other choice. Given their limited resources, this is the best possible scenario for the raise. This is the most money they could possibly make. And we've used linear programming to solve this problem. So hopefully there are no questions. Your last task today will be solving a problem of your own. I'm going to leave this problem on the, on, in here now. You do not have to submit this problem, but you do need to complete it properly in order to solve our, or solve the problems given to you in our attendance quiz. So if you have questions, as always, please contact me. If you do not, excellent. Please solve this problem before your class time is over and answer the attendance quiz to get your attendance marks for this class. Thank you very much, everyone, for listening. I will be back in about 25 minutes to turn this off or to end the video. I will leave this information on the board right now for you to look at and reference 
while you solve this problem.
All right, everyone, if you have any other questions, as always, please feel free to contact me. If not, I'll send, I'll send information on Thursday about our class then.